the communications manager with uh, C Plus. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Can, am I a professional communicator? Apparently not. <laughs> so my name is Mira. I'm the communications manager here at C Plus. Thank you so much for coming out. This is really exciting for me to see so many people here. Um, I'm not surprised because what a cool topic. Um, but it's just great to have everyone here tonight. Um, I know you're not here to listen to me. <laughs> you can't talk into a microphone. Um, so I'm going to try to be really brief but then explaining kind of what we're doing here and why. Um, so okay, in Parks and Wilderness Society, we have two goals. Uh, our first goal is to protect half of our wilderness areas against horrible things like motorcycles. <laughs> to protect half of our wilderness areas for future generations of people and wild, wildlife. Our other mandate is to connect people to nature. And so that's when we launched a new initiative called CEQAWS in the City uh, to kind of create events in the city like this one, like our paddle night, we've got photo hikes coming up. Um, uh, just opportunities for people like you who care about the wilderness, who care about nature, to get together, create a sense of community, have a chance to talk to people you don't know, and uh, to be reminded about why it's so great to get outside of the city as well. So, um, so just a couple tiny bits of background, since I have a captive audience, thank you. Uh, Manitoba currently protects 11% of our wilderness. CPAWS is working on a number of campaigns that would actually double the amount of protection area in our region. The campaign that I am the most passionate about is the Seal River Watershed. It is amazing. Um, it is 50,000 square kilometers. That's about the size of Nova Scotia. There is not a single permanent road. There are no hydro lines. There are no dams. There are no mines. It is a pristine beautiful, intact wilderness area north of Churchill. And there are four First Nations who are working together to protect the entire watershed as an indigenous protected area. It's really a remarkable campaign. It's kind of the thing that you could like put on your tombstone <laughs> if you're a part of it. And um, hopefully you guys can all help in whatever way you can. Um, one way to do that would be to sign one of the postcards we have in the bar area. Uh, urging our government to support this initiative. Um, I'm also hoping that you'll sign up for our email newsletter so we can let you know about other cool stuff that's happening um, and occasionally ask you to sign petitions as those letters actually count. Everyone kind of thinks, oh, what's the point? Except it actually does. Um, my boyfriend works for the government and part of his job is to respond to every letter that comes to his department. So there is actually a government bureaucrat that will read your letter, every single one of it, they will register it in a database, and they will tell the minister how many letters you come in. So if we can get 10,000 letters on a campaign, we can get an appointment with the minister to talk about making the party happen. Uh, so that's our pitch. That's what we're doing. Um, and I'm going to introduce Daniel, who's actually um, roommates with Tristan. Uh, a really wonderful guy. He's been working with us here this summer uh, through a grant program and doing really wonderful outreach work. And we are so excited that we're going to be able to keep him on part time in the fall. So thank you, Daniel. You're awesome. Thanks, Mira. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. Just project your voice like you don't have a microphone. I will do that. I, I may have a background in the theater, so maybe I can do that. Uh, perfect. Yeah. And uh, Tristan is, and Sam are both loud, so it will be fine. Uh, so as we were said, I'm Daniel. I work here for the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society uh, as the environmental ambassador. I think that's the name they came up for, with for me. Uh, so here with me today are my good friends, I guess, uh, Tristan, <laughs> Tristan Schneider and Sam Anthony. They are the co owners and co-creators of Twin River Travel, which is a uh, canoe outfitting company. It's local here in Winnipeg, and they uh, take people out on all-inclusive canoe trips. So they uh, they go out into northern Manitoba to some of the rivers up there, and they uh, basically give you a good time while you're out in, the, out in the water. All you need to bring are your clothes, I think is what they say. They do everything else for you. So 
they are the experts. Uh, they are going to give you some tips with this uh, for some backcountry trips, all right? So let's start out with some questions. Uh, first, maybe introduce yourself, say who you are, and uh, then I'll grab the mic back, all right? Uh, I'm, I think I'm okay without the mic. <laughs> um, yeah, so my name's Tristan. Uh, I'm one of the two founders. Um, and uh, yeah, we're excited to you know tell you about a few different places to go in the province and then uh, and uh, you know answer some questions because I'm sure there's a lot of you here that are also super experienced and might have a few things to share of your own. Um, I'm Sam, me and Tristan work together. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm also just yeah excited to see like what questions you guys have and I'm sure I can learn a bit from some people here as well. You. Uh, has anybody, just a uh, quick question, raise a hand, has anybody actually gone on a Twin River travel trip here? No. Well, <laughs> I, I didn't mean to ruin your spirit, guys. Um, not, not yet. But this, is your, this is your chance. Guys, if you, if you feel like you can't go on a backcountry trip by yourselves, you can always talk to these guys. 2020 calendar is open now on our website. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right, let's keep going. Um, so, uh, let's start here with why do you guys love the back country in Manitoba and in all of Canada, I guess. Um, uh, that's pretty simple it's because when I was a kid, my parents took me outside all the time and just let me have fun. Uh, so if you have kids, Make it fun, don't make it stressful, just let your kids go outside and play. Just like, total free play out in the wilderness, that's how you grow to love the wilderness. Um, me and Tristan both do a little bit of work in the education field during the rest of the year. I mean also with our canoe trips, we've done a lot of trips with schools. And, yeah, and with CPAWS actually, with students. CPAWS is taking students out with us. Um, but yeah, love for the backcountry is born when you're a child. And as a kid, there's like there's nothing more fun than just given, being given free reign to explore in the wilderness. So that's how that's how you get people to love the backcountry. Uh, yeah, what I'd add to that is like, you know, even as an adult, you can, you know, become uh, totally enamored with the wilderness. Like for me personally, I don't I don't go out on too many of my canoe trips anymore. You know, we have guides and staff who uh, help run our programs. But, you know, come middle of August, and, you know, I'm really feeling the mid-season, you know, beat down and all of that. And when I'm, you know, really feeling, you know, the burden of city life, I go on one of my own canoe trips. Because it's like the perfect way to reset just in the wilderness, in the middle of nowhere. You know, no cell phones, it's quiet, no cars. It's just, I think it's just like the ultimate relaxation opportunity <laughs> you can get away from me yes. uh, so I guess the next my follow-up to that is why did you decide to uh, make a living taking people out doing these trips yeah uh, maybe it's just easier if I talk like this no you want the mic uh, okay so well, my follow-up is then uh, why did you decide to try making a living by, by taking people out of these uh, backcountry trips. Um, we both, like I, I grew up doing canoe trips, Tristan grew up racing, uh, he was a he was a kayak, sprint kayak racer, national team level, um, and we'd done a few canoe trips, you know, with friends, I'd done, you know, dozens of canoe trips with my family, um, both of us were in university, basically just tired of our summer jobs and started, we were like, oh, we should get a job of guiding canoe trips. So we started looking around Manitoba and we're like, well, there's really no option there. Um, so the logical next step was to just sell our own canoe trips and bring people out and guide them ourselves. So that's, that's why we decided to start doing it. Um, we had a, a few years of university and being stuck in the city both of us after high school went out and traveled for basically a year straight. So after two or three years in, in the city, just going to university, having to work all the time, we like, we really wanted to get back to that. Um, and this was the only way, you know, Manitoba canoe tripping was our area of expertise. That was where we knew we could, uh, we could make a career out of it. So we, uh, we had to start our own business to do it, but 
Okay. Yeah, what I'd add to that is um, the, uh, like, for what we do, you know, backcountry canoe trips, I'm sure a lot of you, uh, you know, are familiar with it and go on your own trips and plan them and have a great time. Uh, but what we, we realized is, like, if you're not, if you haven't done it your whole life or haven't really gotten into it, the barrier to entry is quite high for the average individual or couple or family. You have to go and buy a canoe, you know, get your roof racks going, buy all your camping equipment, plan your food. It's not the easiest thing in the world. So we were just trying to create a product and an opportunity for people to, you know, experience it, you know, at ease and uh, without all of the hassle. Uh, so you guys have uh, three standard trips, the Bird, the Bird River, the Seagram, and the Manitou... Manitou... Go, Manitou... Can you pronounce it for me? Gotagen. Manitogotagen. Um, so what made you choose these uh, these three specific trips out of uh, any of the other ones? Um, one of those is just like logistics. <laughs> uh, both three are pretty easy. Both trips are pretty easy to access from Winnipeg. All those trips are drive in, drive out, so that keeps the, the prices from getting insane when you have to start adding flow plane trips in. Um, we wanted to have a little bit of something for everyone, so the Seagram Lake is our easiest trip, you know, really short, six kilometers a day. Bird River trip is the next one up, you might be doing 15 kilometers a day. And then uh, we're both really passionate about whitewater, and Manigatogan is. I think like one of the best beginner whitewater rivers in Canada. It's one of the only drive-in, drive-out remote rivers in this area. Um, the whitewater, there's a lot of great whitewater. There's nothing too crazy, um, but enough that it'll challenge you. You know, this runs that challenge me and I consider, you know, I think I'm pretty good at whitewater. Um, and, and also importantly, it, it's super safe. If you're not comfortable with a the rapid, there's a portage on every rapid. There's, there's no like must make moves or must run rapids. Um, but yeah, basically we just wanted something for everyone and we wanted we wanted it to work in a way so that if somebody had never gone on a trip before and came out with us and did the very basic beginner Seagram trip and then said that was fun but that was too easy. Next day they could come back, do something a little bit better and then they go, oh well that was fun but I'm ready for something bigger now because that's, anybody who does backcountry trips knows that's how it works. Every every trip you do, you're like, okay, now that's not okay, what's next, what's bigger, what's better? Um, so we try to, we get a lot of people who come back year after year trying harder and harder trips. You're good, Tristan. Oh, okay, uh, so for the more seasoned camper, uh, are there any trips or any trips that you would recommend outside of your own, anywhere in, in Manitoba or even Canada, I guess? where you recommend going? Uh, so, I guess I can talk about a couple of rivers in the province that are just unbelievable. I've had the you know pleasure of doing one of them and the other one is on a bit of a bucket list of mine. Um, the first one, which uh, we were fortunate enough to do last fall with Travel Manitoba, um, was the Blood Vein, which is just you know a phenomenal fly-in river. You get dropped off near the border uh, of Ontario, it's, you know, you fly out of Bisset for, you know, half an hour, get dropped off Artery Lake in the middle of nowhere, and paddle for, you know, a week and a half, two weeks, uh, just straight to Lake Winnipeg, um, down class, you know, three to five whitewater, um, you know, completely isolated, completely remote, and just stunning. Uh, I mean, the campsites were just incredible. The wildlife, we saw lynxes, well, a lynx. <laughs> Ambitious there. A herd of lynx. Um, you know, <laughs> plenty of river otters. You know, all of this kind of phenomenal northern Manitoba wildlife, which is, you know, so cool to see. Too close to a bear. Yes, too close to a bear. <laughs> Took one of our food barrels. Last night, pretty lucky. Not too bad. Um, and so that was just stunning. And, you know, we, we capped that trip off in the, uh, you know, town of Blood Vein. Um, where you know they just successfully um, gotten a uh, UNESCO, the new UNESCO World Heritage Site designated um, for the Pemetrona Key uh, area, which encompasses uh, four uh, four different uh, indigenous communities and uh, the entire Blood Vein River. 
and so they're super excited about that and we got to do uh, sweat with one of the elders in the community and it was just like such a phenomenal interesting way to uh, to finish our trip yeah and as well as we had a talk at the school about tourism and the opportunity for some of those kids to think about you know making the rivers and canoeing and the what you know the outdoors maybe a job in the future um, and then Sam will talk about the other one. I think this is both of our bucket list river, and I know we've already talked about this a bit, but the Seal River in northern Manitoba. Um, it is one of the biggest rivers, like one of the most famous rivers in Canada. The like level of... Basically, you just have these huge wave... I don't know if a lot of you guys know a lot about white water, but it's just huge wave trains for like 10, 15 kilometers straight. It's one of the hardest rivers in Canada really remote, really difficult to get there, really long trip, um, and you have to deal with polar bears, um, <laughs> and you end your trip in Hudson's Bay. Uh, so yeah, we definitely one of the most challenging trips in Canada, but um, one of the most spectacular, like most incredible whitewater trips from what I've heard, so it's, it's on the list for sure. Um, we were talking about trips that we would recommend. Yeah, trips I got for season campers. For season campers, okay. Well, if this is a, a mid-level trip, you don't need to be super experienced for this. But I just want to plug something because I was just there earlier this year. If you've done the Ontario before hiking, head out to Thunder Bay and do Sleeping Giant Provincial Park. Incredible hiking. I know this isn't in Manitoba, but Sleeping Giant Provincial Park, like really, really good. Spectacular, like gorgeous, great climbs over these huge cliffs overlooking Lake Superior. Um, also, I've never like. That was the least sore I've ever been on a hike because every evening you get to jump into the four degree Lake Superior and have an ice bath. <laughs> so yeah, fantastic for the calves. <laughs> yeah, no, would recommend. Uh, there's, and you can do, they have hundreds of kilometers of trails. You can do a two week trip or a two day trip. Uh, yeah, no, that's my plug for uh, Sleeping Giant Provincial Park. And I'll just add, cause I think Sam did the seal a disservice, but that obviously <laughs> does, uh, Flow, that you know, the entire river is a part of the Sea Paws, um, the Sea Paws uh, Seal Watershed Project that they're trying to get protected, and is just uh, like just it in, like you're paddling through the tundra, which I think uh, a lot of people don't realize about the seal. It's not it's not one of our you know classic Canadian Shield canoe routes where it's granite and you know like evergreens. No, you're paddling through these enormous canyons in the middle of the tundra, you know, and I mean, it sounds like a bit of a joke, but you know, you, you have stories of people who are just, you know, they can't stop for, you know, a, you know, a couple of hours because uh, there's polar bears just, you know, wandering down the shore beside them. And, you know, that's, that's a, you know, a fun addition to a uh, canoe trip that most people wouldn't necessarily, uh, you know, think about. Thank you, that was, I, I do really want to go up to the Seal River because polar bears look adorable. They might not be that friendly, but they look adorable. Um, so, since we've gone with experience, what about uh, trips for people who are just starting out? So they've never really gone on any uh, river trails or any backcountry things. What, where would you recommend for people who are just starting out? Um, go to Nopeman Park. Nopeman Park is great. All the canoe routes are really well marked. Um, you should go on the Manitoba Parks website, has them all laid out. There's five or six different canoe routes that you can do. Campsites are marked, portages are marked. It's a little bit less busy than, say, the White Shell. Um, there are a few other areas I've wanted to get to as well. Um, there's a MyCCR, there's a website. MyCCR, it's uh, all the canoe routes, maps, everything. Um, if you go look up Experimental Lakes area, that's another great option. Maybe, maybe a little bit more experienced because none of the portages or campsites are marked, but there are a lot of, the portages are easy to find. There are a lot of campsites. That's another great area. Um, if you're really just starting out, I would honestly just like throw some panniers on your bike and bike out to Birds Hill. There's a bike path the whole way there. I love Birds Hill Park. <laughs> there's a bike new, there's a Duff Roblin Trail that goes all the way along the um, floodway. You can take Gateway into East St. Paul, Birds Hill, get onto the floodway, bike all the way there, set up camp there. If you're really, like, if you've never gone camping before, 
you want to try something, that's a great option. Um, riding Mountain National Park is really easy, really fun, gorgeous. Yeah, when I think backcountry, I think Bird's Hill. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been like three times a week. <laughs> but um, no, I'd agree with everything you said. Um, I, I'd have to, you know, repeat that noping is just brilliant. Like the Seagram Seagram uh, Lakes routes or the Bird River are just like phenomenal <laughs> beginner routes that, uh, you know, what's nice I think about them too is like if you're used to camping at. Uh, you know, car camping at, you know, a standard site, it's nice because you still have a fire pit, um, a picnic table, you know, a toilet there still, so you're not, doesn't feel like you're quite in the middle of nowhere, which is nice. Um, and then, I mean, obviously there's, like, the quintessential, like, Kine or Manitoba Canoe Route, which is, you know, Caddy Lake, um, which is, in my opinion, a little too busy, especially this time of year, but, I mean, still pretty cool and, and just a great, like, one night, two night trip. Yeah. You should uh, get a Bird's Hill Park Twin River route going, I think. <laughs> I think that would do well. Um, the swimming lake. Yeah, just, it's a nice little swim. Um, so for these people who are uh, new to camping, is there any advice you could give them uh, beyond where to go? Like what, what could they do with their, if they're just starting out with these camping experiences? Um, I, I'd say just don't don't stress out too much. Um, like people, people get really worried, and like you know, I know with the internet now, like you can spend hours and hours googling every little thing. Like, oh, is it better to bring two tarps or one tarp, and this type of tarp, or is this tarp too heavy, or oh, do I have to drill holes in my toothbrush so it weighs you know a little bit less? Like, <laughs> it, it, there's an endless hole. Like you can you can get so lost in preparation. Uh, but you really like you just need to think about your basics. Make sure you have some way to cook your food. So you know if there check if there's a fire ban because if there's not a fire ban, you're gonna need to bring a stove, a camp stove. Make sure you have you know clothing to keep you warm and dry. That's the most that's really the most important thing. Make sure you're gonna stay warm. Make sure you're gonna stay dry. Um, I'd honestly recommend don't even check the weather. Like just pack for everything. <laughs> Maybe that's bad advice, but I I like I tell people. Like, do check the weather, but pack as if you hadn't checked the weather, right? <laughs> um, like, make sure you're going to have safe drinking water. Um, so you can always boil water, but, you know, bring a, bring a filter, and then you can boil it in case you need, and, you know, in case your filter breaks, because filters break all the time. Um, other than that, though, like, just start small. Don't stress about every little thing. Um, you're going to, like, every time you go out, you're going to go, oh, I realize, like, that tarp kind of gets a little bit wet when it rains. Maybe I'll bring a different one next time. Or, oh, that like, uh, these shoes are a little bit slippery. I'll bring a different one next time. Like, um, unless your very first trip is like an eight-week northern backcountry canoe trip, like, you're going to be fine. Just cover the basics. Go out there, have fun, and learn a little bit every time and slowly build yourself up to bigger stuff and uh, start worrying a little bit more about gear after that. You don't, you don't need the best equipment for, a, you know, a two-night hiking trip. Yeah. I agree with everything Sam said. I'll just add, I have like, when I, <laughs> when I'm going on trips by myself or with some friends or whatever, you know, you always reach a point when you're done packing and you're like, you know, do you have everything? No. You know, never make a list. Ridiculous. Lists are ridiculous. <laughs> Lists are but, <laughs> But often, you know, often the last thing that's said is, well, we have enough. <laughs> and I find that's generally very true about uh, camping and backcountry stuff, is you got enough. You're going to forget something. Always. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I'll remember never to bring a list. Uh, <laughs> ever. Um, what about for the people who are more experienced? Uh, do you have any must-haves or must-do when, when you go on a backcountry or a uh, more difficult backcountry trip? Well, if you're doing whitewater, I would always recommend that at least someone in your group has um, the appropriate uh, like swift water rescue training and knows how to use uh, a pin kit and all of those essentials and the rescue techniques involved as well because, I mean, 
you know, it's not going to happen every trip, and it probably it can, it can easily not happen to you ever. But if you pin a canoe, or someone, yeah, someone gets a, you know their foot snagged uh, on the riverbed, like it is very important that someone in the group knows how to respond to this situation. So even for a beginner whitewater river like the Manicotaupin, it is important to know that kind of thing. And then I would also add, um, again, it's not super necessary for the beginner stuff, but when you get to a certain point and you're, you know, out on a trip for a week, or two weeks, or three, you know, when you're getting to those longer trips, it's also very important to have someone who is trained appropriately in first aid, like in a wilderness first aid or advanced wilderness first aid, and that you have a first aid kit to respond to the situations uh, you find yourselves in out there. Yeah, um, as, they, as far as like optimizing stuff, I don't want to get too much into gear because wilderness gear is an extremely political topic. Um, and everyone has everyone has their preferences. Um, but just in terms of like safety, having a some kind of like a satellite communication device is really great. So inReach make a great product, Spot make a great product. Um, it's a bit of an investment, but once you start to do bigger trips, it's really, really smart to have one um, and yeah the training though I, those uh, like wilderness first aid advanced wilderness first aid whitewater rescue really really great courses really valuable um, and you'll just feel a lot more comfortable and confident um, taking friends and family out to the backcountry if you have those courses so um, there's a uh, momenta is one organization in the city that runs wilderness first aid courses they usually run a few every year um, Whitewater Rescue only comes into this province every couple of years. They usually do it in Thunder Bay every year. Um, it's a couple of companies that offer it though. Look it up.